Hello everybody, today I'm going to teach you how to make some uh, animated UI elements for your game worlds, basically holographic displays in this case. So how about something like these? These are actually really easy to build, but they look nice, so I'm going to teach you how to do it. We're going to build it right over here next to this other set of holographic displays that I've got running. And we'll put it right in the middle. So the first step whenever you're doing a UI is to add a canvas. Unfortunately, adding the canvas adds it as this giant, not really in the game world construct. So you've got to change it from the screen space over into world space coordinates, and then you've got to shrink it way down. Like that. I generally set the pixel width at this point too. We're going to do it 256 by 256, but there's no particular reason for you to have, you know, you, you can have it however you'd like. It doesn't have to be any particular size. Depends on what you need. And it's kind of in the middle of nowhere, so let's go and drag it over to our character, who I believe is over here somewhere. Yeah, he's over there. There are faster ways to do this. But none of the other ways let you go nyrp a whole bunch. Alright. The other important thing to do before you get really into it is to make sure you know which direction is the front. Now, normally speaking, you can rely on this blue arrow to be pointed out the front. So we're going to rotate it so that the front is facing us and pull it out a little bit in front of this fence just so we don't get any clipping issues but just to be double sure that we are facing the right direction I'm gonna add a button and it should be facing us oh see it's backwards I shouldn't have trusted it oh, no don't don't rotate the button rotate the whole canvas now the reason that's important is just because otherwise our animation will have all of its stuff screwed up so uh, it's better to make sure that it's facing the direction you think it's supposed to be facing. And there we are. So this canvas is going to be the central focus point of our UI. Uh, but we're going to be creating a lot of pieces to this canvas. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a new UI element. But we have to create it inside of an empty, uh, an empty game object. So we're going to call this a, um, a glowing key. Easily, easy enough, right? and we will go ahead and set it up so that it's the full size and lastly we need to add in a canvas group this canvas group will be the center of our animation system we will be animating this glowing key rather than animating the um, the canvas so we've got a glowing key but obviously it isn't glowing yet so let's add the UI element we want which will just add a panel and we'll make it uh, how about nice and transparent and blue there we are, that's a glowing key. But this glowing key is huge. I mean, it's enormous. So let's go ahead and reduce this. We don't want it to be anywhere near this big. There we are. That looks a key size, don't you think? Okay, so the next step is to add in an animator. I hope the audio quality is good here. Um, I'm not quite sure. <laughs> All right, animator. You can see that the animator has no controller, so we're going to need to create one of those. I recommend that you have an animations directory, because uh, you're going to be creating a fair number of simple animations, and you, you don't want to get confused. I put both the animators and the animations inside of the same directory. So this one will be our uh, CG key uh, controller. CG, of course, standing for canvas group. Most of my animations are on the canvas itself, not the canvas group. So now we want to make an animation. Here is the animation console. You can add it down here if you'd like. It's a very straightforward thing to use, uh, and we'll go over it right now. When you hit record, if this is your very first time, you will be asked to save it. Make sure you save it with something that uh, you'll be able to distinguish later on, because you may end up with a couple hundred animations, and you don't want to lose track of which ones are which. <clears throat> Normally, I go with a one-second animation time, and uh, so at the beginning, what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to have all of these at zero, 
not interactable, no alpha, no blocks, raycasts. And then you go over to one and you just turn them on. There you go. And if you were to pan across this, you can see that it fades in. But a fade in is kind of a boring thing to do, so let's make it flicker. The way to make it flicker is to go into the curves, like so. Get nice and close, so you can see what's going on here. I think you might be able to double click. Uh, yeah, here, you can double click. What's... That's not how it is, is it? Oh no, that's that alpha. We want the alpha. We don't care about the others. Um, so with this alpha, you can see that it's this nice slope. We want to put in some flickers, so let's just click, click, double clicking will add keys like this. Then we can grab this guy and drag him down. But you can see that that distorts the entire uh, everything. It makes everything distort funky because it tries to draw a smooth curve through all of your animation component elements. First things first, we want that to be a zero. Oh, somehow we selected over here. Oh, uh, the red line is what's actually selected. That's confusing. So I guess you'll have to unify the red line in your target key if you want to use this editor. But the next thing we want to do is we want to stop this this swelling. If we look at it here, it swells. And that's not a terrible look, but it's not very mechanical. So we're going to change this from auto into broken. And that will let us do this and this. And on this side, we'll also do broken. And we will do this and this. So that gives us a real sharp snap. See? Snap. And we're going to want to do one more. We'll go that over here, but this one we will make significantly more deep and detailed. So we're going to have two drops in here, right? But then we'll end it down here. And we're going to have to break it. So break. <coughs> We want this one to be zero, and we want this one to be zero-ish. Doesn't really matter if it's actually zero or not. And once again, we need to specify that these are broken. Even though broken has a checkbox, oops, don't want to do that. Even though broken has a checkbox on it, it doesn't necessarily mean that it is in fact set up to be broken, as you can see. So you'll have to set them up manually. No, stop that. Stop that. There we go. So the result, if we go back into the dope sheet, is that we have created a whole bunch of keys. And you can also create these keys manually. But we're going to actually have a... Uh, we're going to adjust these keys a little bit by simply dragging them. You can see that this one, when we dragged it, I double-clicked. If you double-click, it creates a key all across all of the objects. And that's not really what we want to do. So we're not going to do it like that. We'll just do it like this. Now if we hit play here, you can see that it flickers in. And it's a nice look. It might be a little bit stuffy though. Uh, it looks like one second or a little bit under one second is a little bit short. So what we're going to do is we're going to make it a two second animation. But the key here is we don't want to actually have a two second animation with all of these elements. I'm going to go ahead and put it in. Oh, come on. But the issue is we, we don't want to wait until the end to actually make the blocking raycast and interactable happen uh, because if we do that then the, u the user will have to wait two full seconds before they can click on it. So we're actually going to put those here at the, 30, at the half second mark. Uh, this is frames so uh, 30 means that it's half second because we're going at 60 frames a second here. At least that's as far as I can tell. There we go. So now it becomes interactable at this point, just as the second set of flickering is happening. But the second set of flickering is a little bit too close to everything else we want to do, so let's go ahead and move it like so. Except these guys. Stop. I don't want didn't want to move them. Alright. Sorry about that. So now when we hit play. It's a much more relaxed intro. You can hit Control S to save, or you can just click this. Now, if you are still on recording, you want to make double sure that you stop with the recording. When this is active, changing things will screw up, so you don't want to leave it active. You want to stop it. You don't want to use it at all after that. All right, so now we have this animation, right? But if we hit play, 
and we walk over to it, you can see that it just kind of flickers in repeatedly. That's because it's a looping animation. All animations loop by default in Unity, so we want to find it here in our uh, animations directory and just turn it off so it doesn't loop. And now it flickers into existence and then stops at full opacity. Perfect. So that's not exactly what we want it to do though, is it? What we actually need it to do is uh, flicker in when we get close and flicker away when we are not close. So to lay the foundation for that, we're going to actually access this um, CG controller here. This is, it, by default, all of the animations you create in, a, in an animator and in an animation controller are added to the controller. So our animation is already in here. We'll just copy it and then paste it. And this will give us a flicker in zero. It'll, it's a clone. We change this name to flicker out and we change the speed to negative one. And that means that it'll, it'll go away. Now let's go ahead and make a transition back and forth. And we're gonna add a new bool, which we will call show, uh, shown. You can call it whatever you'd like. I'm just gonna call it shown because that's what I happen to have called the other, the other objects in my game world. But we aren't really going to add that here yet. We're going to leave those as uh, uh, we're going to leave those transitions as exit time because that way we'll be able to see it flickering in and out. But we don't yet have a controller that will actually uh, control it as it shows up. So we want to create a controller for that. We can add the controller to the individual glowing key if we would like, in which case each key would be responsible for spawning in. The problem with that is that you don't get that nice ripple and we really like that ripple. So we're going to go and add the controller to the canvas here. We're going to need to create a new script, so go down into your scripts directory. I've already got a script that does something very, very similar to this, but I'm going to create a new one. We're going to call this the uh, Serial um, UI Summoner. Why not? And we're going to drop that onto the... We're going to wait until it compiles, and then we're going to drop that on the canvas. Oh, I dropped it on twice. So here is our serial UI summoner. Pardon me. Oh, pollen count's very high today. Public uh, uh, animator um, children. There we go. Here in start, we say, actually, we don't need it to be public. Pri protected is fine say children equals uh, get components in children animator there we go now we have a list of all of the children in our framework and they'll be ordered in the same way that they're ordered in the unity drop down menu moreover because of the way this works we can actually nest keys inside of keys which I'll get to later here in update, we're just going to check for our uh, position via the main camera. Like so. Wait, how do we tell how close we want to get? That's a public variable. So here is where all of our code goes for summoning or unsummoning the keys. But we are going to have to keep track, just for the sake of not continually calling every single animator, we're going to have to keep track of whether we are con currently considered active or not. We'll make that a public as well. Yeah, we'll make it false by default. But we'll allow whoever is, is in control to change that in the inspector. So here we say, well, if we're close enough to see it, then if we're already showing, don't worry about it. Otherwise, sounds like someone has decided to hammer a piece of pipe right outside my window, which isn't a euphemism for, every, for anything. That is actually exactly what he's doing. So we want to set the bool shown to true. 
and we also want to set showing equals true. So we keep them synchronized, see? Otherwise we do the opposite. There are probably, I mean you can save some lines of code here, but it doesn't really matter and we may want to actually have other kinds of logic built in here. So this will do for now. However, there is one more thing we actually want to do here, and that is we want to make sure that if uh, we're showing or not showing when we start, we want to set that up properly. There we go. So that'll work fine, but we do need to make sure that our animator understands that when something is showing or not showing, it changes its transition. So here we're going to change this transition to if it's not showing, it flickers out, and if it is showing, it flickers in. But we're going to make flickering out the default. Now if you were going to do this like really well, what you would do is you'd have a default where it was just missing entirely, so that you wouldn't have like a second of, of uh, in-game time where it deflickers. Watch, I'll show you. Even though it's not triggered, it's still there for a second. You see that on the right, too? That's a little bit lazy, but I'm not going to waste my time at the moment doing it the other way around. So here, you can see that it flickers in when we get close, and it flickers out when we get farther away. Pretty easy, right? Except that's not going to be a serial flickering in. We'll go ahead and show you what I mean. By the way, doing this all on one canvas is slightly more efficient than having multiple canvases as far as I can tell. So that's just how we'll do it. So if I hit play now, they'll all vanish at the same time and they'll all get called in at the same time. And we want that nice ripple effect. So how do we get that ripple effect? That's pretty easy. I'm going to show you how I did it. Um, and then I'm just going to copy it over because I have a hard time remembering some of the words uh, that we use, because I never use them for anything else, and they're kind of kludgy. So let's open up the script that I actually used already. Alright, so what is it that I've forgotten how to do? Ah, I enumerator. I can never remember that word. So annoying. Um, so we'll just go ahead and, and grab these lines here, because otherwise I won't remember them, and I don't feel like looking them up again and again and again. So here is the activate in turn, and what that does is it will activate each button in a row rather than uh, activate them all at once. So we're going to grab this and put it here. We're also going to go ahead and put showing equals true here. The key to this is that we yield return wait seconds delay here as well. This does mean that we need to have a wait seconds. Uh, yeah, that'll do. Oh, it's, ca it's called delay. So this will activate in turn by, it'll start at, at zero, it'll set the first one to shown is true, and then it'll wait for 0.1 seconds, it'll set the second one to shown is true, and then it'll wait. So you have a nice ripple effect. Pretty, stra pretty straightforward, right? All we need to do is, in here, we use the phrase start coroutine, activate in turn. I think there is a way to do this without using a string. Um, I should be able to just do it like this, but for some reason that doesn't work. So you have to pass it a string. Uh, this whole area of Unity is very kludgy, um, and it sort of misunderstands how threading works, and it's not actually using like threads or parallel processes or anything like that. So uh, you can't really expect a very good performance out of this, but we're not looking for a good performance here. This is really cheap. We don't have to worry about it slowing down or anything. Now there is a problem here where we are going to have a um, we're going to have a situation where we can actually be activating and deactivating one right after the other. But what it'll do is because it'll take a little bit of time. Um, for us to physically move closer and further away, we'll end up with a shimmer where buttons all animate and then deactivate like one after another, uh, and it'll look pretty nice, even if we are like just aggressively approaching and uh, and running away from the console. 
So they should all fade out at once because that's how we set it up. But as I get close, see how they all come in at different times? Now the only problem here is that they're not actually in the order you might think that they're in. You see how that third one is the last one? Well that's because when I duplicated them, it just created them in whatever order it liked. And you can see how this key, the fourth key, and this key, the third key, they're not in the order that you might expect. And I think that this is um, an annoying misfeature in Unity. Uh, I really wish that they would stay, if they're going to rely so heavily on order within the, in, within the hierarchy view, then they should keep order within the hierarchy view. But all told, it's not that big of a deal. Let's duplicate it, move it down. And you'll find that these keys are in uh, a kind of arbitrary order as well. What's up with that? So this one is supposed to be the third one. This one is supposed to be the first one. This one is supposed to be the last one. No, not that last. What? I don't know what happened there. Don't really care. There we go. That was annoying, isn't it? That's okay, though. Now the great thing about this is that these are significantly cheaper than actual canvases would be, so you can do this with a lot of buttons, and unless you're on a mobile platform, you won't have to worry about it slowing down at all. The only thing you have to worry about is that it randomly sorts these, as far as I can tell. There's no, there's no order to how it gets laid out. Um, so now if we hit play, we're going to have two rows of keys, but the problem is that the way that they'll come in it's kind of arbitrary. So you're going to have to spend some time trying to figure out the order, or you can sort it in your um, um, in your script. We can put a sort command right in here if we would like. But creating a sort command in Unity, or rather in C Sharp, is actually an abysmal and annoying uh, process that I'm not going to take you through. So um, you're you're gonna have to just live with this scrappy little performance uh, until you know you get sick of it enough to build your own. There is something cool about uh, uh, the way that it works, even when it's out of order, though. So, for example, we can rotate this entire set. Right now, we've got it around the pivot, so let's undo that and set it to around the center. There. Well, no, just want to rotate on the blue axis here and then pull it forward. There we go. Anyway, it, it coming in a kind of arbitrarily isn't so bad, really. It's kind of an interesting look. And we've got ourselves a little console. Let's move the whole console up. But we do have a situation here that is a little bit annoying, and that is that all of these simply flicker into existence. It's actually best to have two or three different kinds of animation, specifically so that you get a nice uh, look. So what we're going to do is we're going to take one of these glowing keys, and we're going to duplicate it and move it up, like so. But we are going to change it. So instead of being... Um, instead of being scaled at... Well, we could change the scale, but I think it would be easier to change... No, I guess it's easiest to change the scale. So that's point zero. Oh, that's point 0.1, so I'll change it to point 0.2. Point 0.2 and point 0.2. For reasons unknown to me, um, the rotation has reverted to unknown. I'm not sure why it would ever be unknown when I've only got one thing selected, but whatever. So we've got a larger button here, and we're going to change this animator out. We're going to give it a different animator. So we're going to bring it up here, and we're going to go up to the animations directory, and we're going to create a new animator controller. We're going to call this one the CG uh, slide in. So we've got a, well, I'll call it CG key slide in, just to keep the naming convention. And um, obviously, the idea here is we're going to call this something other than glowing key to keep it separate. Sliding key is good. And we're going to replace our uh, CG key controller with a CG key slide-in controller. 
And then when we go over to the animation, it's going to be empty. And we're going to create a new animation, which we will call CG Key Slide In. We already have something called a CG Key Slide In, but they're different object classes, so they don't overlap. Anyway, the basics are the same. You just go to the canvas group and you deselect everything. And then you go over to two seconds and select everything. And then you can go, you know, over here someplace, point three, and make sure that it's interactable and blocks ray casts nice and early. And now you have nice sliding in feature. But uh, unlike this uh, previous button, these are going to be mobile. So what we're going to do is we're going to move them. Uh, there are lots of ways to get it to trigger as a moving object using um, uh, using the animator and stuff. I generally just hold control and move it down and then back up because that'll trigger it as being exactly where it is and we don't have to worry about that anymore. And then we can go over here into the two second mark and we can move it to wherever we want it to be but it's actually better to not do that. It's better to understand the phases that you want to move the key during, the, the, the way you want to move the key. The first thing we want to realize is that moving the key like this is going to make it difficult for us to... Uh, we're not going to be able to see the key very clearly until about here. So what we're going to do is we're going to actually make this key solidify in alpha really fast just so that we can get a good impression of it. One is probably too high. How about 0.7? Uh, and that way when we animate it, we'll be able to see it sliding down as, a, as the player. So we'll slide it down like this. And that goes you. And then what we're going to do is over here at one second, we're going to pull it forward. Yoop. But position.z is different from anchor.position.y. So what happens is we end up sliding forward like this. See? So we want to grab this here and drag it over there. And then at this point, we want to start rotating it. Um, because the rotation can have several different triggers, I generally uh, uh, trigger it right where it's supposed to start rather than trying to bring it in. But you can see how that results in this weird... And the reason for that is because when I started the rotation, it set me up at zero with whatever I had started with, which was that rotated piece. So you got to be a little bit careful not to screw that up. If worse comes to worse, you can always change the rotation like this, zero. Anyhow, the result here is that it comes down, and it comes forward, and then it's going to rotate slowly, like that. So we get, mm, oop. And then what we'll do is we will set up a full key here, and over here at 2, we'll slide it back. By the way, sometimes global is not global, but if you double click, it'll always go back to being global. So that's that's how you can deal with that. So what we're going to do is we're going to make it come forward, rotate, and then go back. And the end result will look like this. But you can see there's a little bit of weird wobble at the bottom there. And as you might remember, that's because our curves try very, very hard to become curves rather than actually just being strict. So once again, broken. That'll do. And I think that's all that needs it. Yeah, and we can do it here too. There we go. And now when we hit play, much sharper. We do have a wobble on the rotation though, so let's fix that too. Here you can see it. No, that is the wrong thing. I want the purple one. There we are. To get it into the front, if it's not at the front, click somewhere else on the line and it will become the front object. Let's make this sharper, like so. That'll do. So, now we hit play, it'll go you. Oh, that's got a little bit of a double hump, doesn't it? Let's go ahead and not, not have a double hump. Alright, that is good enough for our purposes. And now we've got a sliding key. And we also have it so the sliding key is automatically added in. Um, hold on. Stop recording. <laughs> Follow my own advice. The sliding key is automatically added into the roster. So we can duplicate the sliding key. Move it. Move it. Move it. Oh, I just moved that 
see how that offset? I accidentally clicked on the panel. I wanted to click on the sliding key itself. There we go. But we are encountering a problem. All of them are over there now. That's four keys stacked on top of each other. What's up with that? Well, the animator actually animates the position absolutely, meaning that it doesn't say, oh, well, you moved it down 0.2 meters. It says, you moved it to negative 0.2 y. So all of these, because we have an animation with coordinates, all of these get sucked over to the right, over to the initial animation position. Uh, to get around that, it's actually not that hard. You just have to create an anchor, which we'll call a sliding anchor. Um, and then what we do is we add all of the sliding keys to their own sliding anchor, like so. And I'm going to delete these keys, don't need them anymore, and we'll duplicate the sliding anchor key instead. Now uh, we could do something where we change it up, but let's just make sure that the animation still has it in the right place, because it's possible for that, that anchor, yeah, okay, that's fine. Since it's in the right place, we're not going to worry about the fact that the anchor is technically offset from the sliding key, uh, because it won't matter. There we go. Hit play. Oh, the new animator hasn't been set up correctly. No biggie. I just forgot about it for a second there. So um, in the sliding key animator, just open it up and do the exact same thing we did before. Copy, paste, slide out, speed of negative one, make transition, make transition, Parameters, bool, shown. Shown is false. Shown is true. Make default. Nope. Make default. Uh, and of course, the other thing we have to do is this CG slide in animation doesn't loop. And that's what happens when you get close and then back away. And this is what happens when you just get close. Not too bad. All of the panel, of course, is a little bit offset and a little bit in the wrong space. So let's move it up and grow it. Say 512 by 512. Is that not going to grow its children properly? All right. In that case, we'll change the scale to 0.002 and 0.002 and 0.002. There we go. And we can put button on, buttons on these. They'll all work just fine. Um, one of the things I wanted to do, however, is create wing panels. So to do that, we'll just take these guys and I'll duplicate them and then I'm going to rotate them. Hold, con hold control and rotate like so and then move them like so and then I'm going to duplicate that and this is when it would have been nice to have the um, sliding anchors in place before we did our animations because they're offset uh, but that's okay it's not a big deal it's just a little bit annoying to my personal sense of style so if we bring that in you can see that the wings are a little bit too close that's no problem we just take these wings here and uh, we take these broken wings <laughs> we move them down and we move them out Normally, uh, its best practice is to animate the buttons starting from wherever they're stopped uh, rather than starting from wherever they're going to start because that way you can tell where the buttons will be when you're moving them around rather than having to actually look at them like this. Um, I forgot that to do that. Still, not a big deal. And you have a really cool 3D control panel. You can put whatever you want on it. That's the same technique I use for this.
and this control panel works fine. Anyhow, I hope you learned a lot, or at least I hope you learned a little, and uh, thanks for your patience.